All right, now how can you do it? The two primary ways of doing it is through drugs. That's the conventional way. You already can tell that I'm not an overly conventional fellow. Um, but also diet, which is less popular to talk about. Now, for the sake of drugs, um, I'm going to, I have to unfortunately present this somewhat through the, in the context of type 2 diabetes. Um, just because if it's an anti-diabetic drug, which is the, how that class of drug would be called generally, it is only really helping if it's solving the insulin resistance. So let's just take a little time to talk about these anti-diabetic drugs. This, these are the most common. Metformin, GLP-1 agonists, SGLT inhibitors, thiazolidine diones, sulfonylureas, and insulin. For the sake of time, we won't talk about all of them. But just to look at any drug, when you are putting this foreign substance in your body, what you have to appreciate is that you are picking up the stick. And you're going to pick up both sides of this stick, even though you might only have wanted to pick up one. Or to say that all another way, you must balance. Everything that happens when you put this thing in your body is going to be a consequence. So it is, are the consequences I want worth the consequences I don't want? And unfortunately, in many of these instances, it is very much on the right side of that. Maybe I should have swipped, swapped it. Um, all right, so this is my own kind of classification of these drugs. And, and very, very briefly, metformin is the most widely prescribed anti-diabetic drug on the planet. And for good reason, it actually works pretty well at improving insulin sensitivity. So it actually is improving insulin sensitivity and thus improving blood glucose levels and generally improving the metabolic health of the person. Even still, as effective as this drug is, there can be substantial GI problems, which is why people generally stop it if they do. Even still, even modest lifestyle changes are capable of two times the improvement of metformin at improving metabolic health. And then a final thought on metformin that gives us some pause and why I can't give it an A grade is that it actually partly works by being a mitochondrial poison. Now that's dramatic. Um, thank you for giving me that somewhat of gas response. But nevertheless, metformin does affect the ability of the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, to work well. It inhibits its function. And this becomes a problem in muscle. And this is then no surprise that in human studies, they find that if a human exercises, the mitochondria get a little better and bigger and stronger. If they exercise and take metformin, it wipes it out completely. If you've been told to take metformin to improve your diabetes and, and you're being told also to exercise more, one of those is directly negating the other. Pretty sobering. All right, now what about GLP-1 agonists? You guys have probably heard of Wagovi and Ozempic. This is a drug that people are even bragging about. I've never seen anything like it. Now, what about GLP-1 agonists? GLP-1 agonists <coughs> are taking advantage of this incretin hormone, incretin being a hormone that comes from the guts and helps regulate blood sugar, the most famous being glucagon-like peptide 1, GLP-1. Again, this is the most famous class of drug on the planet or at the moment. Um, it is ridiculous how, much, um, how popular these have become. Now, the, uh, at the lower dose of, of the GLP-1 agonists, which was the, is the drug Ozempic, at the lower dose, although even that dose has moved up a bit over time, the main mechanism of action is that it, it, it lowered the level of a hormone called glucagon. And glucagon is insulin's opposite. Whereas insulin wants to lower blood glucose, glucagon wants to increase blood glucose. And because GLP-1 agonists, when they inject that in, it's inhibiting glucagon, so it's bringing down this hormone that's trying to increase blood glucose levels. Does that make sense? So by inhibiting glucagon, it's lowering the glucose that is in the blood, thereby improving the diabetes. And when this drug first came out at that lower dose, I actually said, I can, I can get behind that, which is why I kind of give it a slightly green color. Unfortunately, at the same time, the scientists learned, well, if a little bit of this is working that well, let's just dial it up to an 11 and boost it up, and that's the difference between um, Ozempic and Wagovi. It is simply about five times the dose of the exact same molecule. What happens at that dose is that not only do you still get the inhibition of glucagon, which can lower the blood glucose, but now you begin to really slow the movement of food through the stomach and intestines. That's a process called peristalsis. It's the natural contraction. We, we're not doing it on purpose. It's what's called smooth muscle. The intestines are just slowly moving stuff through themselves, all to be eventually evacuated from the body. What happens then at this level is that they basically stop moving. So if you eat something and you're we've all been eating a little bit, um, the food is going to stay there in our stomach, turning around and digesting for about three to four hours, normally. 
when people are on these high levels of GLP-1 agonists, it can stay up for 24 or 30 hours. And so people will find that they actually have this putrid burping and breath because the food is literally festering in their stomach. Isn't that delightful? All right. And so hunger goes down and they lose weight.